Hey y'all, and welcome to this week's From the Vault episode from the Magdalene House podcast. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Dallas, Texas, and known affectionately by many as Maggie's. Every first and third Wednesday, we bring you a new release and our From the Vault episodes. We share podcast releases from our three different podcast series, Recover Ed, Recovered, Interviews with Alcoholics, and Hope for the Family. Our podcasts aim to connect, inspire, and educate alcoholics, loved ones, and the community to the Magdalene House and the services we offer. We are so glad that you're here. Thanks for listening. Hi, Caroline. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us. Um, I'm just going to give a little synopsis about um, what this is here for those of our participants who have not done this before. So what this is, is a tool exclusively for Next Step participants. And I like to think of it as like a guide, guided conversation um, because I don't really know what we're going to talk about and what's going to happen. And it really allows the girls to ask questions that um, maybe they want more information about, ask you about your experience, the steps, the book, anything else that they want to like dig a little deeper on that we don't get to talk about in regular meetings and also get to know you a little bit better as well. That being said, will you just start off just giving us a little bit of background about yourself? So my name is Caroline. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. Um, My sobriety date is September 5th, 2007. Um, I do the Maggie's every other Tuesday at 2.30. My, this like doesn't, is not, I don't know if this is relevant, um, but my mom is Cindy and she did this uh, interview with a drunk like a couple, like a week or something ago. And she did say it was her favorite time talking in all of her life. So um, I'm really excited about that. Um, I, uh, I guess like in a quali- like a qualifying as an alcoholic kind of way, I guess what I would say my experience, what, when I'm telling my story, one of the things I talk the most about is um, this idea that before I got sober, I was someone who kept, like I went to my first treatment center in 96, and then like my second uh, center, a wilderness camp in 97, and everywhere I went, I kept getting diagnosed with a drinking problem and being told the solution was to stop drinking. And that was very frustrating because I couldn't stop drinking. And so um, one of the analogies I like to use a lot is it felt like I was in a car that wouldn't start and the world kept saying, oh, Caroline, I know, just start it. And I would be like, oh. And they'd be like, Caroline, you have to really want it to start. I'd be like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> and like the whole world's driving by me and they're not trying at all. And what my experience in AA was like was that AA came along and was like, oh, Caroline, our cars wouldn't start either. What we found is some cars don't have gas. And so no matter how hard you try to start it, they won't start. Instead of 12 tricks for starting a car, here's 12 steps to a gas station. And that's like the, this idea that these steps are steps to a power rather than even steps to sobriety was, was revolutionary for me for a couple of reasons. One, it made me feel, I don't know the word, afraid, sad, something, alone, Anytime people kept trying to tell me that sobriety was the answer to my problems, because what what I couldn't explain is that being sober was the nightmare for me. That that's why I kept drinking. So, so the whole idea of AA was that people were threatening to take my medicine. That they were taking the thing from me that made living okay, that made being okay alcohol for me was very medicinal something is wrong with me sober that that keeps dooming me to drink um 
And what I found, again, is that AA isn't this, again, I thought AA was one day at a time, in AA, one day at a time, you were going to be dying for a drink. And no matter how bad you wanted to drink, just don't drink, no matter what. And you do that every day for the rest of your life, one day at a time. And if you can do it for 365 days in a row, we'll give you a chip. The end. And I mean, I just, there was not a worse fate that could befall a person as far as I was concerned as to find yourself in AA. It, it was just the worst case scenario. People tried to scare me sober all the time with like, you're going to go to jail, you're going to end up homeless, you're going to end up hospitals, institutions, all of these things. None of those things were scarier to me than being sober. None of those things <clears throat> were scarier to me than, than what I imagined was going to be a life of dying for a drink and I'm just now not allowed to have one. And so why I love to do every, like to speak on AA in any way, especially at Maggie's, is because I feel so grateful that that isn't what AA is. That AA is 12 steps to a power that will do this impossible thing for me. That I'm not fighting alcohol one day or the desire to drink ever, really ever again. The, the thing going back to the car analogy is that what I found is that if I'm in a car that won't start and someone gives me 12 steps to a gas station, that's great. The only thing that will keep me from the gas station, the only thing, the only thing that will keep me from the gas station is me trying to start it. And anytime someone would say, Caroline, just don't drink no matter what, they might as well have been saying, just keep trying to start it. The only thing keeping me from the solution that AA is offering, the only thing keeping me from this power was me virtuously just trying to do it myself. Me trying to stop myself from drinking is the thing keeping me from the power that will do it for me. And so any chance I have to, to, to go share with another person that um, to lift the weight of this impossible task of just don't drink no matter what, when, when I'm doomed with a mind that's going to insist that I drink, I, I, I want to do it. It's, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, AA not only... Um, did the not drinking for or this a got me to a power that not only did the not drinking thing for me but but in such a way that i don't have to engage in that fight at all the the desire to drink has been lifted because the problem that it was medicinal for has been removed and and so i'm not saying i mean normally i would i would spend like 55 minutes describing what i just described in six um, so I don't know if I did a very good job, but, um, yeah. but that's sort of, that's my thing. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to any of the girls have questions. And are these girls in the house or no, these are the people They're, who are uh, part of the, these are girls part of the next step program. Got it. Yes. Okay. Well, you all, if you don't have any questions right now, I always um, have questions that I want to ask. So you got sober in New York, correct? Yeah. Is the AA different in New York than it is down here? So I had two home groups in New York and one was like a 600 member uh, fancy group. And um, it was very, it was considered very strict and very in the book, but it also had a lot of rules that were not in the book. Like it's, um, it was very much in my experience in New York AA was it was very, um, all of New York AA was very traditional in that, um, you know, rules like no dating for a year, no, um, you couldn't sponsor until you had a year, whether you did the steps or not was completely irrelevant. Um, 
uh, I, my sponsor taught me to do a step a month so that by my 12th step, I would have a year so I could sponsor because she didn't know what to do with me if I finished the steps before I got a year. Um, I, I've only like been a member of one home group in Dallas, so I don't know what Dallas AA is like. I know that my home group in Dallas is very different from that. Um, very. Um, and so I don't know if it's a regional thing. I think it's like, I, now I'm just speaking opinion. So it could be very wrong. Um, I get the sense that that's, that's just like AA in general. And then there's pockets of places that don't, that are, that are more in like, so the, the book, for example, says hurry and do the steps before you die and also hurry and do the steps before this other alcoholic dies who needs your help. So hurry and do the steps so you can help this other alcoholic before everyone dies. Um, and again, in my general experience of AA, that's the opposite. And so it's, it can be very confusing. Well, so one of the things actually that we're, um, that we're doing right now in next step um is we are doing um a home group assignment um and so would you um explain to to your to the girls um and it can be your opinion or whatever the case may be but um why we have a home group why that's important yeah from my i'll tell you i'll try and tell you my truest version of an answer which is at first, at first, no. Overall, I think the reason that you have a home group or the reason you go to meetings is so that you're in the space where newcomers might show up and someone needs to be there when they show up. That's, that I think is the whole point of meetings is um, it's if, if helping people is part of my solution, uh, an AA meeting is a perfect place for me to go to find access to that solution, the solution of finding people to help. That's like the, the general, I think, most correct answer. My experience, though, is with things like a home group specifically is it, A, gave me something, I don't, I hate this word, but it was something for me to hold myself accountable to. So it was like, um, like I, I went to go help, uh, like you get a uh, commitments like, um, greeting or setting up chairs or making coffee or picking up cigarette butts or whatever. Um, and I mean, it's, there's, there's nothing so profound about those commitments, but there's something really revolutionary and profound for me. Um, the day I became someone who showed up just because I said I would, like I never did that before. I was I was very much at the mercy of what I felt like doing. And so I, it gave me the opportunity to build this muscle of making a promise and then keeping it. And then making a promise that I'd come back and then keeping it. Um, so there's So there's that, there's also this idea of, this group of people was in this room when I showed up for the first time and they showed me how to not die from this disease. And um, the right thing for me to do is to, sh is to give back to that group, is to be there for the next person who shows up needing strangers to help them. Yeah, I think that's... No, I like that. Thank you very much. Um, I like that being at the mercy of what you feel like doing yeah. <laughs> yeah um i would never do anything then <laughs> um right. kristen what's your question what does living in 10 and 11 and 12 look like for you you know like getting when you first got sober to now like what is that process for you because you know i'm in that you know with the recent relapse and just going back and learning the thoroughness and the book and just really what it means to become unblocked and to be you know living with my higher power so 
you know, you have a lot of knowledge and experience. Um, so just, yeah, what does it look like to do, to be 11 and 10, 11 and 12? Awesome. So um, in the beginning, it's amazing. I don't know what the collect, like the combined time of everyone, uh, not even so much sober, but the combined amount of time of people doing this work and doing these steps is, but in it, so I started doing it. I started 10, 11 and 12 in 2008, let's say. So it's been like 12 years of technically living in 10, 11 and 12. And it's looked very different year to year. And some years I do it in a really disciplined way. And some years I don't. Um, and I mean years go by where I don't. Um, my first year, I, um, and then for the first, for the first like five years even, it was easy for me. Also, I was living, my fiance was in AA. And so she was doing that too. And that, you know, that make, it looked, my, my 10, 11, and 12 from the outside looked different in that house than it looks today in this house. So I'll just say that again as just a true statement. But it used to be that um, really in a disciplined way, when I retired at night, I asked myself those questions in the book, um, you know, when we retire at night. And I would, I, I really, I really answered them. Um, and the most amazing thing happened. I kept giving the same answer night after night after night. And, and something clicked with me doing that where this is just one example where, um, you know, it gets to the part, like, where were we afraid? And I would write when Brett calls. And Brett was this guy I was working with and I knew anytime he called, it was because I did something wrong and I was going to be in trouble and we were going to fight. So I would never answer when he called. And then when I got, when I retired at night and it was, where were we afraid? I'd have to say again, when Brett called and then the next night again, when Brett called and nothing was changing, I was just writing when Brett called is when I was afraid. And there was something in going through the process, like the actual formal process of it, all the way through the um, being careful not to drift into remorse or worry or morbid reflection, um, really going through that process where something finally clicked and I realized, oh, I don't need to be brave enough to face bread. I need to be God reliant enough to see how, uh, what God wants me to hear from Brett, which is just a different way of approaching it altogether. And the next day when he called, I finally did pick up again, not because I was brave all of a sudden, but because I'd kind of been restored to sanity that, that, um, I was curious to see what God wanted in that moment. And that's just like a tiny example of how something, you know, in the 11th step, it says, we'll intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us, but also talks about how our, our intuition will get placed on a different plane. That's, that's when I started to see on paper my psychic change, evidence of my psychic change. And again, I was really disciplined and, and what was probably the most remarkable thing about it is when I retired at night, I answered those questions on paper. On awakening, I did a meditation. All throughout the day, um, I watched for all the things that we watch for. Um, and I sponsored a lot and carried the message a lot. And many days in a row would go by where I would when I retired at night, answer the questions on awakening, meditate. When I retire at night, answer the question on awakening, meditate, and nothing would happen. And the most amazing thing that did happen is I kept doing it anyway. That was, that was like a weird thing. Again, that was sort of a symptom of my psychic change was suddenly I was just doing it because I, uh, thought that, that I, that's what I was supposed to do as opposed to doing it so I could get like a God high. I don't know if that makes sense, but 
Anyways, the point is for the first five years, it was very disciplined on paper, by the book, by the letter. Today, it looks different. I don't on paper. Um, my, my, my 10 and 11 is very gray and undisciplined. And it, the 12 and 12 says um, great love and great pain, I think, are our two disciplinarians. Right now, great pain is more often a disciplinarian for me. So, so 10, 11, and 12 aren't so much, but this is good because they're not 10 and 11, set aside 12. 10 and 11 aren't so much assignments that I have to do. They are ways out of my bondage of self when I get into the bondage of self. They're, they're tools. They're, um, there's things given to me, not like just busy work assignments. And so while I'm less in the letter of the law today, I'm more in the spirit of the law of them today. That's what today looks like. That's awesome. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, so that actually reminded me of something. Or did someone else have a question? I didn't see it. I was gonna just add one other thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I do think 10, 11, and 12, and again, set aside 12. 12 is its own uh, non-negotiable thing. Um, I didn't get free at all. I, I secretly still wanted to drink until I was doing 12. Like 12 was, um, one through 11 are just the steps to 12. Like 12 really is non-negotiable for every reason, but mostly because for me, this stuff didn't become alive to me and alive within me until I was working with others. And, and I was working with others poorly. Like I was doing it wrong looking back. Like I wasn't even that good at working with others and that was okay. It was the um, it was the working with others. It was the 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 line in the book that says um, just to the extent that we do as we think God would have us, we don't even have to get it right. Just to the extent that we do as we think God would have us, um, I know God would have me try and help someone. And then uh, so anyway, so that's twelve. The the amazing thing the psychic change that happened for me with 10 and 11 is five years into my sobriety, everything shifted. And I told the story a lot from a podium, but my fiance, my AA fiance left and suddenly I was homeless and a hurricane came and I didn't have any money or a job or a fiance or a house or anything. And that's how I ended up back in Dallas. And I was so scared and hurt that I, um, that I was catapulted back into self-reliance. So if the whole journey of AA is a journey from self-reliance to God-reliance, I threw myself back in self-reliance. My, all of my brain was saying, I got to get a new fiance. I got to get a job. I got to get a new house. I, I got to, I, 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 and I completely, you know, my roots grasped the old soil. And that was fine, um, but what was what was really amazing about that is I that's how I learned that the name of the game isn't how good can Caroline be, how good can Caroline do the steps, how let's bear witness to the wonder that is Caroline. No, the name of the game is let's see how powerful God can be. And the only way for me to see how powerful God can be is for me to fuck up. I have to fuck up for God to grow. And so now, rather than being like ashamed and hiding from how much fucking up I was doing, it actually turned into this whole thing where the bigger my fuck up, the bigger God had to be. And so my God got huge. And that really is how I got freed from the bondage of self. I spent those first five years of AA where I was doing it by the letter. 
I was completely missing the spirit of it because my sponsor would call and she'd say, did you do your inventory last night? And I would say, yes, check that box. In fact, I wrote in complete sentences, look how much I wrote. And I did so good on my day. I didn't get resentful one time. And I was never afraid one time. And I threw myself into the, and it was all about me. Like I was looking as if, as if my sponsor's applause was somehow going to keep me sober. I, I missed in, in trying to do AA perfectly to the letter, I missed out on the spirit of it. And I only got access to the spirit of it by really fucking up, by, by, by um, self-reliance failing me. And, and 10 and 11 is, was the way out of that. So I cannot speak enough about how amazing 10 and 11 are. And I think the most important thing about 10 and 11 is that each person has their own authentic experience with 10 and 11. That's my, that's that. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I was muted. Sorry about my, my son's music in the background. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for sharing that. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Um, I do. I, Kristen asked a question I was going to ask, um, but I was going to do, ten, say, 10, 11, 12. So I know you touched a little bit on it, but that was the biggest thing I was missing um, when I first went through Maggie's. And, um, and so can you kind of share about, I love how you said this is non-negotiable because that's like the key, you know? So can you share some about that? What it First, looks like? Step for you? 12. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, this is what was kind of wacky about growing up in an AA world where you had to have a year first for a lot of reasons. One if you can go a year not drinking without sponsoring, then sponsoring doesn't seem that non-negotiable. It seems like extra credit or like APAA or something advanced. That's how everyone saw it, saw it as, as what people who have extra time do or what people who are like, just kind of like nerdy about it do. It didn't come across as non-negotiable. So that, um, my experience with it was when I got my, like, I can't remember how it all worked out, but I was like on my ninth step and I went to a meeting and a woman came up to me and she said, like, how much time do you have? And I said, nine months or something. And she said, how many steps have you done? And I said, nine. And she said, okay, this girl only has two days, so you can at least help her for now. And I was like assigned this sponsee. And the, the way sponsorship worked in this world where I was, was good sponsorship was being really strict and really kind of a dick, like really hard ass. Like that was, that was what people deemed to be strong sponsorship. Like we'd go to the diner and you could, hear all the sponsors on the phone with their sponsees and it was like they were trying to out dick each other it was so weird just like like trying to be whoever was the hardest ass was like the strongest guy or something it was but that's that's what i learned so my first couple of years of sponsorship i will be honest i was kind of a dick and i i gave advice i had no business giving and I had opinions I had no business having. And I voiced them without being asked. And I bossed these people around and I cringe about it to this day. And shockingly, I didn't get that free. <laughs> you know, I mean, believe it or not, it didn't work that great. Um, and, then, and then what my story goes like this, like one or a couple of years into sobriety, a man I knew, well, I'll just be honest. I was in, am I allowed to talk about that? I was in CA also, or is yeah, that? Yes, you can talk about whatever you want. Okay, so I was, I, I had two home groups because I had my AA home group and my Cocaine Anonymous home group. And 
uh, and CA smaller. And this guy from Algeria and CA called me one day to ask me something and I couldn't make out what he was saying because he had a thick accent. And so I just said, uh-huh and hung up, came to find out that what I said uh-huh to was he had asked if I would be in charge of uh, H&I for New York, which means that I was agreeing to make sure that a meeting went every day to every hospital and institution and detox and rehab and prison in New York, which is a huge undertaking. A couple of things happened. One, I had been fired from my job, so I had the time. Two, as I said, you weren't allowed to sponsor or carry the message even until you had a year. So no one could come carry the message with me or for me. Um, also, 12-step tw work was not, was not non-negotiable. It was optional and extra credit. So I couldn't get people to go with me or do this for me. So in this really divine twist of fate, I found myself having to carry the message at least one, two, three times a day to all these different institutions. And at first I was carrying the message I had heard from other podiums of like, again, kind of tough, dickish, hard ass, like the message is this, and if you drink, you'll die, you know, real like hard, whatever. And again, imagine this, I, no one was helped, <laughs> including me. And I kept seeing the same faces in the same, just a different rehab. So I'd be in this hospital one week and two weeks later, those same people are now at this hospital. And now that same person's at this hospital and no one was changing. And just every day I was running around yelling at people. And I got really tired um, and it felt really futile. And so then little by little, I thought, if I'm going to be doing this anyway, let me just with this in this group, in this hospital of people, let me just put the book aside for a second, put all this, put the letters aside and let me just tell them what I did, like what my story was. And I found out that my story is 100% aligned with what the program of AA is. And that's kind of how I learned about the actual like spirit of the program of AA. And, and, and I really did. I started carrying the message that I had recovered by and had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. That's like fancy speak for what my story actually is, but that is my story. And then that's how I found out that that's how I found out why the 12th step is non-negotiable. It's, it's something we can think about intellectually, but it wasn't until I experienced not what a good speaker I was. It's not until I experienced my true story helping another person that and and really the best parts of my story were the worst parts of my story and how my gross this was serving these people and it was and i don't mean i don't mean that hyperbolically or like poetically i mean literally my shit was like the medicine for these people and then all of a sudden i found myself like I remember one night it was raining and I, and I didn't have a job, so I didn't have any money. I rode a bike everywhere and it was raining so hard. My fiance said, you can't go to the hospital tonight. It's raining too hard. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And then I sat down on the couch and I started thinking, but, but, but there's a chance that if I don't go tonight, people who are there I might, I really, not in an ego way, I might be their only access to this program. I Like I have to go, not, I have to. I, I can't hoard this, um, this cure for a terminal illness. 
and and so then I just found myself that again that's the psychic change going from self-centered to other centered but it was a sincere other centered and then I remember um I had remembered that my mom Cindy who spoke who does Maggie's on Mondays you guys know her I called her she called me one time I had remembered this she called me one time early in my sobriety I had like four or five months and she said how's it going and I said it's going great I have four or five months and she said that's great what step are you on and I was like four and she was like four <laughs> you have four or five what are you doing like what else are you doing and I was like no no mom it's fine I feel fine and she was like you feel fine I don't who fucking cares if you feel fine alcoholics are dying of alcoholism and you can't help them till you do the steps so go do the steps and I just hadn't seen it that way <laughs> I just it hadn't occurred to me that the whole point of doing these steps was so I could be available to show other people how to do the steps that is the program steps 1 through 11 are only preparing me for the program which is 12. It, i just i hadn't it just hadn't occurred to me yet and and it wasn't until all of that clicked into place that really and sincerely i was that's when i was freed from the bondage of self awesome thank you anybody else hmm. Okay. Um, well, then. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to follow up on what you just told us, what was it like to have a mom who had struggled with these things and had already had years of sobriety? And was that more pressure for you to feel like you had to? stay the program or was it do you rebel against that because that was your mom's thing um so for me and my specific circumstance i had seen my mom my mom went to her first aa meeting when i was two and i think her sobriety date is like 2003 or something like that so that's like 20 years of trying to not drink uh, that's 20 years of seeing how painful alcoholism can be for someone. And like, as a kid looking at your mom, you're sensitive to that. And, um, so when she finally found the solution, I didn't know that that had happened. Like I, I wasn't paying attention to what was shifting but all of a sudden she did go from a someone like how we all used to be to someone like how we are now and it was so dramatic and it was so amazing i was so happy for her and i didn't know yet that i was an alcoholic so i didn't feel threatened at all when i did get sober i felt so much pressure from my fiance who was in AA that I forgot to feel pressure from my mom who was in AA. Also, my mom was in Dallas. And you know the kind of recovered where you don't put pressure on other people to get sober? Like you're that kind of like neutral about it. She had that. So I remember when I first told my mom that I was getting sober and I told her I had been a cocaine addict and an alcoholic and all these things. And, and I remember like it was yesterday, her saying, oh my gosh, that must have been really painful. As opposed to what? You know, when she just, she just had the empathy of a fellow member of AA, not, th there might be some moms who would try to be your sponsor, but that is, that's actually never been my experience with her, except for when she found out I had four months and was still on my fourth step. And then that was like, and I said, mom, it's fine. I can't sponsor till I have a year anyway. So relax. <laughs> she like threw the phone. 
And I was like, but really, I'm not allowed to. And she literally said, then lie about how much time you have. Like that, that's how non-negotiable helping others is. And so I really, for whatever reason, have only felt myself, felt like the luckiest person to have that particular sober member of AA as my mom. But there are a lot of other ladies that I wouldn't want as my mom. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. No, she's, she's been a great, has not gotten in my program, has been really just someone to look up to, not someone to resent. On the sponsorship thing, I've, I've never met anyone who felt ready to be a sponsor at, at, at any time. Um, like I said, I was... I not only did I not feel ready to be a sponsor, I actually wasn't because I hadn't done the steps and I had um, a real misunderstanding about what sponsorship was. I thought you were kind of a bully therapist. Again, what I found out, the reason why we are qualified to help, it doesn't matter if you don't know what page, what quote is on, that doesn't get people sober. It, it's it's really that language of the heart of let me share with you the message that is I had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps and ev the only thing I even ever have to say is well I had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps and someone says but should I date him or not and I say I don't know I had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps and it's just variations on that theme. I don't give anyone advice. I couldn't possibly. Um, so if anyone's feeling like anxious around that, I don't think you can become a, a good sponsor without going down the path of being a bad one. Like, I think that's a necessary rite of passage. And I just pray a lot, dear God, save these people from me. I like that. Um, so part of the Next Step program is carrying the message. Um, yeah. You know that uh, the girls um, are in a mentorship program, and then um, once they hit phase three, and they have to chair a meeting. Um, then once they hit phase three, they have to tell their story. Yeah. Um, and I know that we have some girls who are nervous about, about doing that. Um, what is what would you say to them? Um, I would say, for, I get it. Um, I, I told this story recently where, so sort of going back to Lacey's question, I did have a little bit of me that really wanted to make my mom proud. You know what I mean? And one time when I had like five years, I came to Dallas to visit and um, PPG invited me to speak. And I was like, oh my gosh, because to me PPG was like Myers and you know, all these folks. And you know, of course, and it's my mom's home group and they didn't have a lot of outside speakers coming in to speak. And so it was this huge deal and I couldn't wait because at this point I'd actually become a good speaker doing all the detox and hospitals and stuff. I, I spoke several times a day. So I couldn't wait for my mom to see what a good speaker I was and for PPG to see what a good speaker I was. And maybe Myers would take me on the road. You know what I mean? Like this whole thing. So um, then I show up on that night to speak and I was so excited to make my mom proud that my entire thing came from old soil. Um, my, my objective was, I, I had forgotten my objective of being useful and reverted back to my objective of looking good. And so I spent a whole hour trying to look good in front of all of these people and like 55 minutes went by and I hadn't even gotten sober yet. Like 55 minutes went by and I was still telling a funny drunk story. And I was 
devastated. I was so mortified that I had let this room of people watch me try and look good. I was just devastated. And um, I threw the, and I, I mean, like I was, I mean, it, I was devastated. And finally, like a week went by and I finally called my sponsor to be like, listen, I'm devastated. And I'm so mad at God that God let me look so stupid in front of my mom and in front of PPG. God knows that I'm willing to be perfect. If God would just let me be perfect, why won't God just let me be perfect? And I, that, that kind of tantrum. And my sponsor said, well, did you pray and ask God to be useful? And I said, yes. And he said, well, um, we don't get a say in how we're going to be useful. And another thing is, is perfect is never useful. So you can be useful or you can be perfect, but you rarely, rarely can be both. And something shifted in me again on that day where I, there's, there's uh, there's a line in the book about how we fit ourselves to be of maximum service. But again, we don't have a say in how God is going to use us. We even pray, God, um, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. And I hope that what God wants to do with me is make me look good. But a lot of times how I'm most useful is when I'm embarrassing myself or saying something stupid and the people around me have to find grace in their hearts to not judge me. And then that's how we all grow together. <laughs> it's so annoying, um, but that's what happens a lot. <laughs> um, so the point being is that if, if your sincere desire is to be useful, you cannot go wrong. You can't. It's very hard to not drift over into wanting to look good in front of a crowd. And that's fine. We'll learn from it and we'll grow from it. That's totally fine. Um, just know that when, when I'm seeking just to be useful, first, when I speak, I look for whoever looks like they have the least amount of time, which is a dangerous game, but, um, but it helps me remember that I'm, I'm speaking to help someone who needs help, not putting on a show for this old timer who I've been mad at for a year. And it's about time you heard how clever I, you know, it, it helps me just keep perspective on what I'm trying to do. I cannot emphasize it enough. If I am sincerely seeking to be useful, I cannot go wrong. I love that. And I'm so happy that you shared that story about your mom's home group because I heard you tell it in Girlapalooza and I came back and I was all excited to tell the girls about it. Um, but I couldn't do it justice <laughs> like, without you telling the story. I'm um, glad you said that because after I told that story at Girlapalooza, I thought that's probably a stupid story to tell. Like people, what a, what a silly first world problem that like the worst thing that happened to me in sobriety is I didn't look good from the podium one day. But that oh. really was like a really traumatic experience. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was great and it was helpful. Um, so I'm glad that they got to hear that coming from you instead of coming from me. Um, does anybody else have a question? Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you something else. Um, that I heard you say on Girl Palooza <laughs> that um, I want the girls to be able to hear because I also tried to, to say it and it didn't do it justice. Um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit um, about, you know, after your, um, you and your fiance, I think, broke up and you didn't have a place to live and all this stuff and you were going down and the car came by and splashed you. Can you tell the girls what your realization was in in that moment and that experience that you had with God? Yeah, it was, it was, um, it really was like the, it was probably the lowest point of my whole, maybe my whole life, but certainly the lowest point of my sobriety. But, and it was the best moment of my sobriety because again, my fiance had left 
and now I didn't have an apartment. And this hurricane, Hurricane Sandy had just come through. And so there was no power and it was freezing. And I just had a backpack and I was looking for a place to stay. And I felt like there's a line in the book that says in the third step, he, God will provide what we need if we stay close to him and perform his work well. Everything I needed was gone. So I could only conclude that God was mad. So much so that I even said, dear God, I feel like you hate me. Do, do you hate me? And right as I said that, a car came by and splashed six feet of water of like mud sludge. I was like, God, do you hate me? And God was like, <sighs> like it was, it was so shocking. But this really amazing thing happened where the next thing I heard in my, like in my heart, I don't know how else to explain it. And my heart was, um, you are never to um, use external evidence to prove me and my love for you again. Like you are never to look outside for what you know, which is that I'm here and that I love you. Something like that. And that's probably... In on the page where it says he provides everything we need if we stay close and perform his work well, just below that, it says like the, um, the big promise is that we'll, we will become conscious of God's presence. That's like the promise. And, and I think what I was drinking to find all along, but in that moment, I became conscious of his presence in a way that was no longer conditional, that no matter whether I got a job or lost a job or someone loved me or they said they didn't love me, none of that was ever to be used as evidence of how God felt about me. And that I think is that, I mean, I, I can't say what a better thing that could happen to a person would be to, to become conscious of the unconditional love that God has for us. Was that the story? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. And I, I was trying to explain that, but it never sounds as good as coming from the person's mouth. Um, so thank you. Do you guys have a question before I ask? Okay, so generally I ask um, a question to wrap up. Um, but I kind of think I, I want to ask two questions. <laughs> um, so if that's okay for you, with you and everyone else. Um, one of the questions being, what is the greatest gift that recovery has given you? And the next question being, if you could have all of us take one thing away um, about sobriety, getting sober, staying sober, whatever the case may be, um, if you could only just give us one takeaway, what would that be? Okay. I think, I think both answers are kind of going to be similar. Um, the best thing that AA gave to me that, that has happened to me as the result of AA is <clears throat> kind of what I was describing with the, my experience of 10 and 11, which is <clears throat> going from someone who was trying to be perfect and do good in order to earn something, going from that person to a person who whose who, my attention is turned to what God can do. So again, I used to try to bear witness to the wonder that was me. <laughs> and AA, these steps, in doing these steps, engaging with these steps, I had a psychic change where now I am genuinely more curious to see what God can do with the mess I just made. 
you know, like I, I don't, that, that bondage of self includes things like the bondage of pride and the bondage of fear and the bondage of shame and the bondage of credit. Um, all of those things that, that I'm going to be in the bondage of if, if I'm the name of the game and in an AA, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the name of the game. The name of the game is Caroline. Um, let's see what God can do. Let is bearing witness to what God can do. That that's that kind of freedom from the bondage of self is the best thing that I think AA has given me. And, um, and I, I don't know if this is answering your question, but what I, what I would want anyone to take away from anything is the magic of this comes from my experience of it. Um, the line, God does not make too hard a terms for those who earnestly seek. It's one thing to think about God and even talk to God, but it's another thing to seek God in something or, or trust God in something, um, to have an experience of God, um, to have my own unique personal, to learn how to engage sincerely with God, especially when I'm fucking up. Um, this is, this, these are steps that were given to us that we have the opportunity to do and engage with, not just kind of talk about or try and emulate someone else's program or tell my story in a way that sounds like Meyer's story, or, you know, it's, it's so tempting to think I need to have my experience look like that or like that. And so I don't engage in my own experience. I try and copy someone else's. But the, but the magic that's offered us is in the experience of engaging with my own story. Thank you. Um, yeah. God, I actually, while you were talking, I was like, now I want to ask her this and this and this. And no, it time's up. Um, <laughs> that's usually what, what happens is we start going and then there's just like so much more to, to dig into. Well, um, Thank you so much. Thank you um, so much for inviting me to do this. It's this was so great. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Caroline. That was awesome. Yes, yeah. thank, thank you, you Caroline. Much. Super rad. Yeah, thank you. All right, y'all. I will uh, see you guys tomorrow. Okay. Nice All right. Love All you right. guys. Bye. Bye. Love you. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye, Caroline. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank really. You. We hope you've enjoyed this From the Vault re-release of the Magdalene House podcast. Tune in every first and third Wednesday for a new release from one of our three podcast series. To learn more about the Magdalene House and the services we offer, visit magdalenehouse.org or follow us on your favorite social media channels by searching for The Magdalene House.